Hi everybody, I'm Scott Stewart with the uh, UT Extension and welcome to another talk at the Cotton Tour in the Milan No-Till Field Day. The topic we're going to touch on today is, is BT Cotton and really we're going to talk about the BT Cottons that are currently commercially available. The reason I qualify that is there are some new technologies. You might have heard of a product called the Thrive On Technology which is a new BT cotton out on the market that controls thrips and plant bugs, at least to varying degrees. Uh, but we're not going to cover that during this presentation. So my sidekick, I guess I should say co-presenter today, is Dawson Kearns. He's a master's student working with me, and his project's been dealing with BT cotton and, and resistance. So I'm going to toss it over to Dawson, who's also going to be starting his PhD this fall, and let him introduce the topic at hand, which, again, is BT cotton. Thanks for that introduction, Dr. Stewart. I'll take things from here. BT cotton is cotton that has been genetically modified to express proteins from the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis. And these proteins are toxic to uh, a lot of caterpillars. And so the primary targets for uh, BT technologies are bollworm, tobacco budworm, and pink bollworm. So these uh, Toxins include the cry toxins, which is cry 1A, cry 1F, cry 2A, and also uh, the VIP toxins, which is the VIP 3A toxins that are expressed in the newer BT traits. And uh, these traits have been widely adopted, and oftentimes they're used along with the herbicide tolerant uh, GMOs. So, what we have here is a chart showing some of the BT technologies that are still used today. That includes uh, Bolgar 2 and Twin Link, which are the two gene traits. And then we also have Wide Strike 3 and Bolgar 3, which express the VIP toxins. And pretty much the take home point here is that uh, these traits have high efficacy against uh, most pests. However, with bollworm, they don't work quite as well as they do on some of the other pests. And so, bollworm is known as uh, Helicoverpa zea. It's a significant pest of cotton. Uh, typically, it's going to be a pest after uh, first bloom, so it's going to come in later in the season. Uh, unfortunately, we have field evolved resistance to the uh, cry proteins such as cry 1AC and cry 2AB, and uh, this results in the need for supplementary insecticides occasionally, especially with the uh, two gene cotton such as Bulgar 2. Now, these pests, uh, they'll move in late in the season, and the uh, smaller larvae are going to be feeding on some of the softer, younger floral tissues, such as squares, and then as they progress in age, they'll begin to feed on the larger, uh, more uh, hard structures, such as the bowls. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, BT traits that are expressed in BT cotton are very similar to the ones that are expressed in BT corn. And so this uh, leads to cross resistance. And so uh, bollworm, also known as corn earworm, when they're feeding on corn, they can actually select for resistance to the uh, traits that are expressed in BT cotton. And uh, there has been uh, evidence of this in the state of Tennessee. Uh, uh, bioassays carried out by Dr. David Kearns at uh, Texas A&M have shown uh, high resistance ratios in some of our local populations. And what a resistance ratio is, it's where you uh, test a, a field population, you compare it to a population in the lab, and then you divide your LC50 by that LC50 from the field population to get your resistance ratio. And in, what we can see is we have high resistance ratios for both CRY1AC and CRY2AB. And now Dr. Stewart's going to carry things along from here on out. Thanks, Dawson. And I'll pick up kind of where you left off. And I think you already made the, that point, but you introduced uh, resistance problems uh, that we're starting to see in recent years. And, and really what we've been seeing in, in recent years is the BT technologies that we're uh, using are providing pretty substantial protection, but particularly with the two gene technologies, such as Bolgard to the original wide strike technology and TwinLink, we've we've seen a need to have to make insecticide applications for bollworm more frequently. 
And, and the chart that you're looking at right now is, is data from 2018 here at the Jackson Station, and we had pretty, pretty good bollworm pressure in these trials. And what the graph's showing you is the percent increase in yield from making an application of an insecticide, in this case Prevathon, onto that cotton. And I think what you'll see pretty readily when you look at that cotton is the biggest yield increase was on the NBT, which is the non-BT trait, almost about 30%. But you'll also notice with the older technologies, the two gene technologies such as TL, Twin Link, Bogart 2, or Wide Strike, we're seeing a significant increase in yield percentage-wise. Uh, compared to uh, uh, non-treated plots. Uh, the stars on the graph actually indicate the newer technologies that have that VIP Terra trait. These are the newest ones that are hitting the market. It uh, shores up control considerably and you don't see any really significant increase by spraying those technologies. That's not always going to be the case. I think all of these technologies under the right circumstance, enough pressure, could re require spraying and, and there's always going to be a need for spraying these technologies occasionally, but it's going to be more common with things like Bolgar 2. Now the wide strike technology is really not being sold anymore. Twin links being rapidly replaced with Twin Link Plus and, and presumably in the next year or two we'll see Bolgar 2 disappear out of the market and we'll go to Bolgar 3 and those three gene technologies are, are probably going to be a little more stable and, and less likely to need an insecticide application. Now when I switch over to this next graph, what you're going to look at is uh, damage ratings in 2019 where we had much lower populations. And, and in this case we didn't have all the different technologies in there, but we did have one two gene technology in there and that was Bogard 2. And again, it's sprayed and unsprayed. And the point I want to make is we had really pretty light populations uh, this last year and they didn't persist very long. And really the only thing that incurred significant damage was the non-BT cotton. So I really just wanted to show this slide to make a point that pressure matters. In the right circumstance, light pressure, sometimes these technologies, even in the presence of resistance, aren't necessarily going to need spraying. But you really have to know what your pressure is and how long it's, being, it's persisting out there in the field. And that's why scouting is very important. So let's talk a little bit about what you're going to spray if you do need to spray BT cotton. And I think a lot of people would like to go cheap. You know, it used to be we used pyrethroid insecticides on bollworm or a pyrethroid plus orthene. And I think there still is an opportunity to use some of these cheaper products in the right circumstance. That circumstance would be where you had relatively light pressure or, and or it was very late in the season and you didn't need to protect the crop very long. What we've been seeing really consistently throughout the Mid-South is that the diamide insecticides such as Prevathon and Besiege are quite a bit better, particularly if you have heavy pressure and you need extended residual control. The pyrethroid insecticides are typically only going to provide four or five days of residual control. These diamide insecticides, depending on the rate, very well may provide two to three weeks of residual control. And in our environment, usually you're one spray and done in terms of having to spray that uh, BT technology and get adequate control. This next graph is really just to make a point, and it's actually showing a little bit of data collected recently from Mississippi State University, and it's just something I deal with and I want people to be aware of. It's sometimes pretty easy if you're a consultant uh, walking through a field or a grower to walk through that field at the end of the season and you'll see a little bit of bollworm damage or rotten bowl, and, and it aggravates people. The same thing happens when you make an insecticide application, and I just want people to have a realistic expectation. Uh, it's not realistic to make an insecticide application one time and expect to see no damage. It's also probably not realistic never to see damage in these BT technologies. So what this graph is showing you is it's giving you a little, I guess, uh, idea about how much damage would really correspond to a certain amount of yield loss. And, and what you're seeing at the bottom of these pictured graphs is, depending on where that fruit loss occurs in the field, it might take six or seven damaged fruit, even eight damaged fruit in 10 row feet a row to equal the cost of a Prevathon insecticide application. So you're talking about 
you know, pretty easily found amount of injury to really justify the cost of $25 or $30 insecticide application. So when you make that insecticide application and you walk every 10 feet and you see a damaged bowl or two, that's really not a lot of money that you're leaving on the table potentially and it doesn't necessarily reflect an insecticide failure. Now it might, depending on what your initial population is, but just have realistic expectations. I walk a lot of fields with consultants and you can walk 100 feet pretty quickly in a field and pick out four or five damaged bowls, but that may be the only four or five damaged bowls in that hundred foot of, of cotton, and, and that's not a very high percentage of damage. So that's really the point I wanted to make there. Now another thing besides picking technologies and making the right insecticide uh, selection is just managing your crop for earliness. This is something we've recommended for a long long time. Try to get that crop in the ground as quickly as possible. Use early to mid maturing varieties that mature before the bollworm moth uh, flight really kicks off. The graph you're looking at is some historical data of our corn earworm or bollworm moth catches. Uh, really for the previous seven years and then the previous seven years before that. And, and what you'll see on both of those lines is as our corn earworm or bollworm moth flight picks up as the season progresses. Uh, really the moth flight that really causes us the most problem is that one that comes out of corn very typically the last week of July or August. The moths that you see earlier in the season are often going to corn. So the size of these moth flights is important. We run moth trapping uh, network or trap lines throughout the state and report them weekly every every year. But the point I wanted to make on this slide is if your crop is maturing early August versus late August, you actually avoid a lot of potential corn earworm damage. Now the other interesting point I think on this slide that I'll make is there's a little green hatched area that you see comparing the previous seven years to the seven years prior to that. And you'll notice there's a little trend that our moth flight's been a little bit lower in recent years. And, and I think that's a little bit of the benefit we're seeing of the BT corn technologies. The BT corn technologies don't do great typically unless it's the VIP trade in there at controlling corn earworm. Uh, but it does reduce it some. And what it really does is delay the development of those larvae. And I think you see an indication there. So uh, with the BT corn technologies, it's probably even more important to get an early mature in cotton variety because the moth blight coming out of corn is occurring just a little bit later. All right, so now I'm going to bring it home and, and try to leave a take-home message with you. And I think one of the messages is I think BT cotton has tremendous value to the cotton producer, but it's not perfect. I think a grower can choose to grow non-BT cotton. If they do so, they need to be good managers of of worms and use the right insecticides and of course use the right variety but there's a lot of value even in this day and age where we have resistance to cry one and and cry two with the newer technologies that have this VIP trade in there, I'm less concerned about that resistance because that technology is kind of covering it up. However, we are concerned that we'll develop resistance to that VIP trade as well. Unfortunately, that VIP trait, just like the CRY1 and CRY2 traits, are being implemented in corn, and we're really discouraging folks from using that VIP trait in corn because it doesn't seem to add a lot of value or yield protection in corn, but it selects for resistance to corn earworm, aka bollworm. Really, one of our take -home, other take-homes would be, if possible, I think it is time to start switching to these three gene technologies, uh, assuming that they yield well, and you have to pay attention to yield data. You don't want to pick a dog variety just because it has the three gene technology, but if you have a good three gene technology, you might want to consider switching because it very well could save you, and I, in fact, would expect it to save you at least one application of a diamide insecticide. And again, that's not necessarily an inexpensive treatment. And just a final take home that I just touched on in the last minute or two, and that is manage for earliness and do all the other things you do for earliness in other insect control. You know, good plant bug management, good thrips management, thrips management actually improves your earliness. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll end my presentation and appreciate everybody's attention.